Excellency, distinguished delegates and participants, I would like to welcome all of you to the closing ceremony of the 18th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. My name is Rebecca, and it is an honor to serve the MC for this ceremony. Before we move on to remarks from the multi-stakeholder representatives as uh, to closing the event of IGF Kyoto 2023, we will have a calligraphy performance and a lecture by Mori Seihan, the head priest of Kiyomizu Temple, one of the most famous temples in Japan. Mori Seihan was born in Kiyomizu, Kyoto in 1940. After graduating from university in 1963, he held various positions, including the chief priest at Shinpukuji Temple and Taisenji Temple. Since 1988, he has been the head priest of Kiyomizu Dera Temple. In Japan, he is also widely known for writing a single kanji representing the year on the stage of Kiyomizu Dera Temple, which is selected through a public ballot in the Kanji of the Year contest sponsored by the Japanese Kanji Proficiency Society. Today, he will write a single kanji that represents IGF Kyoto 2023. So now, please give a round of applause to welcome Mori Seihan, the head priest of Kiyomizu Temple to stage. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am head of Kiyomizu Temple. I would like to say a few words. So first of all, I would like to congratulate the Internet Governance Forum Kyoto 2023, a gathering of people from various sectors of the Internet community, including governments, tech community, academia, and civil societies for successfully concluding the conference with this closing ceremony. Congratulations. I have just written the character for Kizuna, which means bonds. The Japanese kanji character for Kizuna is made up of ito, thread, and hang, half which is related to the character for to pull together. And it originally, this word was thought to have a negative connotation as it was used to refer to a string that connects the legs of a horse or tie up a horse. But it had come to have a positive connotation as a bond that firmly connects 
people. So it had become to be referred to as the bond of friendship or the bond between husband and wife. So now it carries positive connotation. Then this has changed once again drastically over the last 12 years. On March 11, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake occurred. The earthquake ensued by tsunami and a nuclear power plant accident was truly a disaster of unprecedented scale. At that time, people all over the Japan and the world came to the aid of the people in the affected areas. At that time, the word Kizuna was all over the newspapers, on TV, and on the internet. So with this word as a watchword, everyone joined hands and tried to help each other. According to a survey conducted by a company, the number of times the word Kizuna was used in various articles in newspapers and on the internet the year was double that of the previous year. At the end of each year, the kanji character for the year is selected by a ballot organized by the Japanese Kanji Profic Proficiency Testing Foundation. The kanji of the year 2011 was Kizuna, which was exactly what I had expected. At the time, the word Kizuna was no longer used to refer to our personal ties between people, such as bonds of friendship or bonds between husband and wife, as I mentioned earlier. So it carries a wider connection. So the word Kizuna is now used to refer to the bonds that connect people all over the world. And I hope that not a single person will be left out of the Kizuna in which all people can lean on and support each other. This is exactly what the great work of the internet is all about. The main theme of this conference is the internet to empower all people. Everything in this world is made up of connections. All life in this world is supported by the lives of those around us. I have high expectations for the internet as one of the bonds that support such lives and I wish for its further development. In closing, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this prestigious conference hosted by the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Once again, please give a big round of applause to Priest Modi Seihan. So now we would like to hear a closing remarks from the multi-stakeholder representatives. First of all, we would like to welcome Mr. Watanabe Koichi, the State Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications. Mr. Watanabe, please proceed to the podium. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Koichi Watanabe, State Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications. The IGF Kyoto is about to finish its five-day program. I would like to thank 
the United Nations and national and regional IGFs, both at home and abroad, for their preparation and hard work to bring a success to this meeting. My gratitude also goes to city of Kyoto for their hospitality as a city of host. On behalf of the host, Japanese government would also like to thank all the governments, international organizations, companies, engineers and academic communities, civil societies, and students who have joined this meeting. Over the past five days, more than 8,000 stakeholders with diverse backgrounds from all over the world participated either off and online in about 300 sessions and engaged in fruitful discussions on a variety of issues related to the Internet. I am very grateful for that to have happened. I trust many of you enjoyed meeting with people with whom you do not normally have the opportunity to do so. I hope when you go back to your home countries, such exchanges you had in Kyoto will inspire you. Even if you go home and provide bonds of friendship that will last for years to come. The Internet is indispensable infrastructure for our daily lives and economic and social activities. And the landscape surrounding the Internet evolves rapidly. The theme at IGF would also have to change. For example, generative AI has been a major topic for the past year and rightfully was one of the central topics at this meeting. Through IGF multi-stakeholder approach, I hope Japan did its share of contribution to better internet. I am confident that the IGF will continue to be the world leading forum for discussion in the coming years. Finally, I would hope very much that you have energy left in you to enjoy the city of Kyoto and Japanese culture, food, and hospitality. Thank you very much for your hard work over the past five days. With these words, I would like to conclude my greeting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Watanabe. Next, I invite Mr. Kadokawa Daisuke, the mayor of Kyoto City, to deliver a remark. Mr. Kadokawa, please proceed to the podium. Hello, everyone. My name is Kadokawa Daisaku, the mayor of the city of Kyoto. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to all of all of those who have been joining this conference from all over the world. And I would like to thank you all for your active discussions. And also thank you very much for sending information from Kyoto to the world. I would like to also extend my um, gratitude to those who organized this event. So on behalf of the host city of Kyoto, I would like to express my gratitude to you all. The Internet Governance Forum is the most important forum in terms of Internet uh, policy. Um, I am very proud to have been able to host this important forum in Kyoto. So you have discussed cybersecurity, AI, and emerging technology in addition to uh, Internet governance. With this discussion, I hope Internet will develop further 
in order to achieve an ESDG's concept no one's left behind. I believe your work in this forum will contribute to the achievement of SDGs. Kyoto had been the capital of Japan for over 1,000 years. It is blessed with beauty of nature and it's still maintain the traditional landscape as well. And you can access the Kyoto on the internet as well. However, Coming here to physically experience Kyoto is the best way. And in this spring, one of the Japanese government institutions, the Agency for Cultural Affairs, was moved from Tokyo to Kyoto. For the first time in 150 years, Kyoto became once again the capital of culture of Kyoto. We have organization that promotes Japanese food, Japanese culture, and tourism. And we try to disseminate the culture of Japan and tradition of Japan from Kyoto to the world. And we want to also contribute to the world in different means from Kyoto. Kyoto is also well known for tourism as well. However, the, the charm of Kyoto, I believe, is in culture and also uh, product makings and innovations. For example, in Kyoto, the uh, product making, especially ceramic making, had fostered for 1,000 years or prospered for 1,000 years. Now that is used in ceramics, and printing technology is one of the strengths of Kyoto. So printing technology that is now converted to the manufacturing technology for semiconductors and other high-tech devices. And well, 1,000 years ago, there was a picture that was or I'm drawn here in Kyoto to make people understand the Buddhism that is the base for the manga as well. And also on some card, trump card, which were made in Kyoto at the company called Nintendo. So Kyoto is where Nintendo is a base and also the sake liquor so Kyoto has a long history of making sake liquor that is also related to development of biotechnology. And I am drinking sake every year, every day, in order to contribute to the development of the biotechnology. Um, so please, you, you yourself enjoy sake in order to develop biotechnology. Thank you very much. So you can't taste sake over the internet, so please enjoy physically the sake. Of course, uh, we take advantage of the technology of internet in product making, manufacturing, and creating innovation from manufacturing. And Kyoto is also a city of students. About over 10% of the population in Kyoto is students. And there are 36 uh, universities and colleges in um, Kyoto, and there are more than 15,000 students in Kyoto. And also, we welcome many overseas students to Kyoto. That's now uh, count to 15,000. Uh, so Kyoto is also attractive place for the overseas students as well. And also, the, you can feel the, the charm of uh, Kyoto in, in internet as well. So once you go back to your home countries, please access information of Kyoto over the internet. So those who have come to Kyoto more than five times, actually 50% 50, 50 of the tourists uh, are those who have come to Kyoto over five times. 
Oh, there are many people who have come to Kyoto over 10 times. Every time they come to Kyoto, they discover a new a charm in Kyoto. So I hope you will come back to Kyoto in the future. I'd like to close my speech by wishing all the best. Thank you very much. Mr. Kadokawa, thank you very much. So next I invite Ms. Teresinia Alvis Brito, CGIBR Youth Programming Fellow, to deliver our remarks. So Ms. Brito, please proceed to the podium. Konnichiwa. Excellency Minister Kawuchi Watanabe, distinguished participants, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary people. It is a pleasure to address you on this final day of the IGF, also known as the day our bodies are finally used to the Japanese time zone. I am Teresinha Alves Brito, a lawyer and researcher from Marabá Pará in the Brazilian Amazon region. I am a fellow of the youth program held by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. And without a doubt, I would not be able to attend this forum by my own resources. Due to that, I want to highlight the value of youth initiatives. At the end of this IGF, it is now even more clear how we need to step up to the main challenge of our time. We named this year's meeting the internet we want, empowering all people. This has been a significant step towards this urgent goal. However, I have not seen sufficient diversity of people and stakeholders, and even of perspectives. It's urgent and we can do better, whether in internet governance or in the IGF itself. Our struggle in building practical discussion lies on the resistance to recognizing the value of diversity. Therefore, there is a need to take action for a more meaningful mood stakeholders, which needs more diversity of gender, race, social class, origin, culture, and age. That is why different perspectives are and have to be seen as essential assets to internet governance. Otherwise, we will not be able to set the effective insights we all need. Secondly, there will exist no free, open, or inclusive internet if we do not commit to addressing climate change and minimize its impact. Addressing climate change is vital to protecting vulnerable communities, especially children and youth in the global south, from losing their homes and heritage. We are now facing major disasters in Brazil due to unseasonal storms and droughts at the same time. We must remember that no virtual environment will be able to simulate the affection, belonging, and legacy that brings us here. The Amazon forest voice must be heard. In addition, we cannot forget the two billion people who continue to be totally excluded from these debates. In 2023, they still have no access to the internet or lack of meaningful connectivity, mostly in the global south. It is the duty of states but also of the global governance community to come up with answers to tackle this problem, which is both the result and the amplifier of economic and social inequalities. As youth, we are keepers of yesterday's heritage, but it is not possible to solve problems with the same thinking that calls it them. It is already time 
to have us in the decision-making spots. Finally, I call upon the global youth community. The internet that we want will not be given to us. We have to build it. We are here and we are not leaving. Obrigada. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Ms. Ritao. Next, I invite Honorable Cedric Froelich, House Chairperson Oversight and ICT Committees, South African National Assembly, to deliver our remarks. Honorable Froelich, please. Program Director, Excellencies, Honorable Members of Parliament, the large number of youth, women, representatives from the LGBTQI plus formations, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Firstly, thank you to the organizers and especially the hosts for the superb arrangements and hospitality over the last five days that can be best described as a festival of ideas, discussions, and collaboration in the important matters that is facing the world as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. Indeed, there has been very fruitful discussions on the global trends, the initiatives currently underway, as well as futuristic perspectives of artificial intelligence. During his opening address, His Excellency, the Prime Minister Kishida of Japan gave us insight on the work being done by the G7 countries in the Hiroshima artificial intelligence process. And as legislators in particular, we must follow and analyze this very important development that will probably soon culminate in international guidelines and codes of conduct for developers of advanced artificial intelligence systems. This initiative is very important and necessary, but as a member of parliament and legislator from South Africa, I wish to remind us that we should guard against a new digital governance divide between the G7 and the rest of the world. What was absent particularly in the parliamentary track is the broader participation of legislators from countries of the G7 on the one hand and other governments and stakeholders from the BRICS countries who could have been engaged in these important discussions. A new digital divide and what at times are being referred to, especially in Africa, as a new form of artificial imperialism must be avoided at all costs. That is why multilateral forums such as the IGF must be utilized as constructive collaborative platforms to enhance cooperation for the common good of humanity. We must continuously strive to be inclusive in these type of forums by covering the necessary geographic, demographic, and other dimensions in our participation, create more opportunities for youth and women involvement and gender mainstreaming in the work that we do, and further collaborate with the Interparliamentary Union that represent 179 member parliaments in the world. The parliamentary track indeed provided a platform for open discussion and an honest assessment on the role that parliaments must play in shaping digital trust for the internet we want. One buzzword that emerged from this discussion was the need or not for regulation and lawmaking, and indeed, Parliamentarians have the responsibility to make laws and to ensure that the national interest is protected. However, whenever we engage in this lawmaking process, we must be very clear as to what do we want to regulate, why do we want to regulate, and who will benefit from the regulation and lawmaking. It must be the citizens of the country who must be protected from possible abuse and infringements of their privacy who must be at the center. It is thus important that a balance must be struck between regulation 
on the use and the impact of technology, and on the other end, the technology itself. Regulation must not stand in the way of new technological developments. That balance must be created. As such, parliamentarians represent the interest of the citizens, and they are entrusted to put the necessary lawmaking mechanisms in place to ensure prosperity, development, and safeguarding the rights and privacy of their citizens. Yes, while we must be aware of harmful surveillance, privacy concerns and breaches, as well as other potential practices, we must be aware of the advantages that can be utilized by our people. This can be prevalent in a number of fields, and it can be overcome by ensuring that we have transparency, accountability, and inclusivity in what we are doing, ensuring that at international level agreements and cooperation and development are clear, and it is clearly understood in the language of the citizens of the world. And we must move towards the development of norms and standards, that is for the politicians on the one hand, but involve all the stakeholders, as well as those who are advancing and at the forefront of the development of artificial intelligence. I'm of the opinion that artificial intelligence is not an existential threat that mankind is facing. The devastation caused by climate change-induced natural disasters is the greatest threat to humanity at this stage. Let us use and harness and encourage the use of technology that will improve, amongst other, the forecasting of climate change-induced natural disasters and possible global health pandemics, advance universal health care, ensure gender mainstreaming in all our different programs and processes, and advance digital literacy across the board. I want to conclude by quoting a famous African proverb that says, and I quote, if we want to go fast, go alone. If we want to go far, go together, close quote. Let us ensure that nobody gets left behind. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Fraunlich. Next, I invite Mr. Mahesh Kassar, Senior Vice President of Rakuten Symphony, to deliver our remarks. So, Mr. Kassar, the floor is yours. Thank you. The United Nations Under Secretary General, the United Nations General Assembly, Ministry of Internal Affairs, Communications, the Kyoto Government, Excellencies, and the participants of this forum. In last five days, we have dis been discussing in different forums about the internet governance. However, I would like to highlight another aspects of our discussions, which we did in last five days. In 2011, the United Nations judged the internet as key tool enabling human rights, allowing people to exercise their right of freedom of expression and opinion. Despite the efforts from the world's largest internet players to make the connectivity affordable and accessible, billions of people are not yet online. As my fellow speaker, the youth program fellow, Ms. Teresina mentioned, the internet should be accessible and inclusive. More alarming still is a billion of kids do not have access to internet at their home yet. Lacking internet access hampers the development of individual kids. It impacts the progress of the entire swaths of the human race. As an industry, we can and we must do something about this. As my organization, Rakuten, our mission has always been, since the inception, the 
empowerment of the society. We believe connectivity is key to unleash human potential, and we are committed to bring access to everyone. Since launch of Rakuten Mobile, we have been advocating for the democratization of global telecom industry to enable this change. I'm thrilled to be part of Rakuten team driving the change and innovation within the global telco industry through our world-first fully virtualized open RAN technology. Through this change, we welcome the opportunity to collaborate the government, the regulators, and entire enterprise organizations to advocate adoption of the open RAN technology, drive vendor diversity, and establish ecosystem that will enable cost-effective network deployment, which will bring down the cost and make the internet connectivity accessible to billions of unconnected people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazal. So next, I invite Mr. Rodney Taylor, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union to deliver remarks. So Mr. Taylor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. I am honored to speak this evening and I had the privilege in 2017 as the then chair of the Barbados chapter of the Internet Society to lead a multi-stakeholder process that led to the country's first national IGF. We kicked off two days of very enriching discussions on various topics, including the issue of what is internet governance. We also used the opportunity to pay tribute to two people. One was Bernadette Lewis, who is now the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecoms Organization, the CTO, we honored her pioneering spirit as the first female Secretary General of the CTU, a feat she has gone on to achieve for the CTO as well, the first female of the CTO's 120 year history. We honored her for her leadership also for the first Internet Governance Forum in 2005, which was done at the request of the Caribbean community, or CARICOM. We say it's the oldest IGF on record and we will celebrate 20 years in 2024. You will forgive me if I say this every time I'm given access to a microphone, but we are very proud of this fact. The Caribbean IGF has produced a policy framework that serves to guide our member states on matters of internet policy. This is the kind of approach for concrete outcomes contemplated in the options for the future of global digital cooperation which seeks to strengthen the IGF process, the so-called IGF Plus. We also honored another person by the name of Alan Emptage. In 1989, Alan Emptage conceived of and implemented Archie, the world's first internet search engine. In doing so, he pioneered many of the techniques used by public search engines today. He is a Barbadian, and we are also proud to celebrate his achievements. Alan, who is one of the founding members of the Internet Society, was subsequently inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame in 2017. We interviewed his parents and did a short video production at the time. They said they had no clue what he was doing, but realized it was something serious when he started to travel the world and started rubbing shoulders with the likes of Tim Berners-Lee, Vint Cerf, and John Postel. I mentioned these examples as testimony to the fact that in complex and interconnected global challenges, solutions are often best developed by involving a wide range of perspectives and expertise. This is one of the reasons that the city has sought to champion the voice of small island developing states, or SIDS, to strengthen the collaboration, particularly in this area of digital governance and digital diplomacy, not just here, but in other spaces such as ICANN, uh, ITU and the Global Digital Compact, among others. Last year, we hosted the first SIDS IGF 
and are advocating for a focus on digital governance in the upcoming Fourth International Conference on Small Island Developing States, or SIDS IV, that takes place in Antigua and Barbuda in May 2024, ahead of the Summit of the Future. Just today, we hosted an open forum on IGF and the road to GDC, bringing a SIDS perspective to the issue of the future of internet governance and what has worked for small states and what has not. There is a temptation for governments to laud the existing multilateral processes where, for all intents and purposes, one country has one vote irrespective of size. The multi-stakeholder process, on the other hand, while open and inclusive, still requires significant resources in order to participate meaningfully. Just yesterday in this room, at the leadership panel, I raised the issue of greater support and greater linkages with the NRIs and consideration of how we may take a form of this scope and scale in whole or in part to a small state, which could help to raise the profile of the discussions with the stakeholder group and mobilize human and financial resources to bolster their ongoing participation. As we move closer to the Global Digital Compact and subsequently WISIS Plus 20, let us see this as an opportunity to renew our commitment to work together. The IGF process has not been perfect, but it provides a platform for all of us to make our voices heard, to share, to network, and to learn from each other. Collectively, we can come up with solutions to cybersecurity challenges, the digital divide, diversity, child online protection, regulation, or not, of AI, and the list goes on. This is the internet governance forum that we want to give us the internet that we need. Let me close by expressing my appreciation to our host, the Government of Japan, for your excellent facilitation and hospitality. Japan has been a friend of the Caribbean, and in fact, the first time I came to Japan more than 20 years ago, it was with the support of the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, or JICA. And the knowledge I gained then from that study tour has helped, in, helped me in my professional capacity and development to this day. Thank you also to the leadership panel for this opportunity to address you as we close the 18th IGF. Arigato gozaimasu. I hope I said that correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. So next, I invite Ms. Sylvia Cadena, the Acting Chief Executive Officer, AP Nick Foundation, to deliver our remarks. So please proceed to the podium. Good evening. My name is Silvia Cadena, and I'm the acting CEO of the APNIC Foundation. I am honored to be speaking to you today on behalf of the technical community. Let me start by expressing my sincere appreciation to the government of Japan, the Minister of, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Watanabe-san, uh, and Vice Minister Yoshida-san, and in particular, Ida-san, and their teams. We are extremely grateful for their efforts and commend them for an impeccable logistical execution. It is our hope that the IGF leaves a long-lasting legacy that helps to grow the interest and participation from the Japanese community so that we can hear more from Japan in future internet governance discussions. The technical community is responsible for the development and functioning of the single interoperable internet. Collectively, it shares an obligation to steward internet number resources, protocol development, unique identifiers management, core infrastructure components, and others, which results in its stable, reliable, and resilient operation. It is important to emphasize its success as it continues to evolve and adapt, as shown in our response to the COVID pandemic. Over the years, the technical community has pledged support for the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. We are calling all stakeholders to renew their commitment once more and to show support for the institutions and processes that keep the internet working and operating, as their stability and health is of paramount importance to the global community. The technical community shares a story, a history of seeking alignment with different stakeholders by promoting discussions and active collaboration. 
at the recent African Internet Summit, some of the work the regional internet registries do to support internet development was presented, including our support to provide funding for capacity building, research and deployment. On that, I would like to thank the IGF for providing here the perfect scenario to award three outstanding organizations contributing to the development of internet exchange points in Myanmar, Pakistan, and Malaysia this week. Such initiatives require active engagement and collaboration from civil society organizations that continue to be further refined. I would like to include the recommendations from the Scoping Civil Society Engagement in Digital Cooperation session that, would, that was held on day zero from this excerpt. More proactive engagement of the technical community is required. The GDC should not reflect a narrow scope of our understanding as the range of policy discussions reflect the range of issues relevant to internet governance. At the session, civil society representatives caution against this politicization, especially in relation to the constant voluntary technical cooperation that sustains its open and secure architecture. In closing, I would like to leave you with a personal note of thanks. I have been involved in the IGF processes for almost two decades and consider one of the highlights of my professional career to have served as a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group. This is a space that can be fixed, that can be improved, but I treasured. And as, as it has afforded me the unique opportunity to contrast views, expand my understanding, and build an invaluable network of people that continue to work tirelessly for the development of the internet. Our work is not done, and I invite you to continue it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kedena. Next, we would like to introduce a video from Mr. Dennis Francis, President of the United Nations General Assembly. Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in today's fast evolving digital landscape, technology presents us with both awesome opportunities and indeed challenges. On the one hand, it can be a force for good and progress in our world. On the other, it can cause devastating harm, both online and offline. Ultimately, the decision on how to strike a delicate yet pragmatic balance on the use of technology is vested in our hands as the ultimate consumers of technology. In order to empower all people, our priority must be to close the digital divide and to establish the necessary guardrails. The increasing disparity between technological haves and have-nots is one of the most formidable challenges of our times. Indeed, the accessibility and affordability of technology is exacerbated by pre-existing inequalities. A mere 57% of women use the internet, with a staggering 1.1 billion women in middle and low-income countries lack access to mobile internet. It is disheartening that when online, women face 27 times more sexual harassment, defamation, and hate speech than their male counterparts. Beyond the digital divide, misinformation, disinformation, and egregious falsehoods spread like wildfire online and have been responsible for catastrophic consequences by fueling conflict and mass atrocities. Friends, we cannot let the internet be a lawless realm. A stringent internet regulatory framework is imperative to enforce digital accountability. This framework should be developed in close cooperation with all stakeholders, including governments, private sector, international and civil society organizations. I am convinced that the digital compact 
will offer a unique opportunity to address vital aspects of digital cooperation, including artificial intelligence, transfer of technology, and a human rights perspective to new technologies, contributing to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Achieving our ambitions will require a thorough overhaul of our data governance and promoting data literacy among users and decision makers alike. We need more events like this one, bringing together stakeholders from cross-cutting fields. I am therefore immensely grateful to the government of Japan for pioneering this initiative. With the rapid pace of change, we cannot afford to be playing catch up while the world changes around us. I sincerely welcome this discussion and I encourage all participants to couple it with concrete action, which I have no doubt your fruitful discussions will engender. I thank you. And next, I would like to play a closing remark video from Mr. Zhu Fa Li, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The last five days have been intensive, inspiring, and rewarding. I'm pleased to witness that by myself. I'm equally pleased to join you here on the closure of the 18th Internet Governance Forum. By all standards, the Kyoto IGF has been a record with over 8,500 registered participants from over 175 countries across the all continents of the world. We are joined by over 100 ministers, parliamentarians, and the chief executives, and thousands of stakeholders from all levels representing this diverse community, including women and youth. Over 160 national, regional, and the youth IGF initiatives and the 35 IGF remote hubs have allowed hundreds, if not thousands more, online participants to contribute to this forum. But numbers are, of course, not enough. From these numbers, emerging important outcomes, insights, and the key messages as well as forward-thinking actions and policies. I invite you to review and reflect these important outcomes. First, the Kyoto IGF messages. Second, the 18 IGF summary report. Third, outcome documents of the IGF parliamentary track and the Global Youth Summit. And fourth, over 300 insightful session reports you have to put together. I urge you to translate these outcomes into actions through your respective constituency, your government, your communities, and your institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, the past 18-year journey of the IGF has been a remarkable one Thanks to the whole market process of the IGF, let us bottom up inclusive multi stakeholder participation and engagement. The next two years will be crucial before the versus plus 20 and the review of the IGF's mandate by General Assembly of the United Nations. Let me remind you the three questions I put before you at the opening. First, has the IGF delivered on its mandate and purpose? Second, how can the internet better support and accelerate the achievement of the SDGs? Third, how can the IGF best support both the preparation of and the follow up to the Global Digital Compact and the Summit of the Future? Witnessing that our collective efforts here in the past week, I'm confident that 
IGF is indeed delivering on its aimed and objectives. Together, let us do more, empowering more countries and all stakeholders from an inclusive and equitable digital future for all, optimizing opportunities and managing risks. Thank you, all of you, here in Kyoto or virtually across the world. Last but not least, on behalf of the United Nations, I once again express our immense gratitude and profound appreciation to the government of the Japan for its generosity and hospitality as our host. Looking ahead, from Kyoto to Riyadh, I extended our support to our next host, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, stands ready to support you fully. Goodbye, Kyoto. See you in Riyadh next year. And at last, we will show you a video from the government of Saudi Arabia on IGF 2024. Communication is a primary endeavor for human beings, from the initial cries made by babies in their cribs to how we communicate through the internet. It is a part of almost every aspect of our lives. The internet provides a limitless communication space for people, one filled with opportunities that allow everyone to explore their creativity, inspirations, and curiosity to learn. The internet weaves contrasting threads together, narrows distances between people, and ultimate shapes memorable experiences. But what lies ahead for the internet? The internet can drive hope and inspire dreams of a more promising tomorrow, one where people turn their creative energy into reality. The multiple opportunities of the internet are within our grasp. This is an invitation for a collective endeavor to shape a legacy today for future generations tomorrow. With open arms, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia welcomes the world to the Internet Governance Forum 2024 in Riyadh. Excellency, distinct delegates and participants, we are now approaching to the end of the closing ceremony. And allow me to extend our appreciation on behalf of the United Nations and the government of Japan to all attendees of your active participation and productive exchange of view. So before you depart, kindly ensure you have all your belongings with you, and please also be sure to hand over the receiver to the staff at the exit door when you leave. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Once again, thank you very much for your attendance and see you all at IGF 2024.